God, we thank you for the sacred moments we have together. We thank you for the minister here who leads and shepherds this, your people. We thank you for the souls who are present, who have been called to be disciples, to shape and change right where they are. We thank you for the work that you're doing here at Piedmont, the work that we see pieces and parts of, but we cannot see all that you are doing because eye has not seen and ear has not heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of man the things that you have prepared for them. Would you encourage and remind this group that they have been assigned a great and mighty work, that you are going to do great things through them, that there's going to be a great revival in their heart and even on this campus because of their faithful ministry. And now, God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we didn't read the whole thing, but in your time at home, please read the whole thing. James chapter 4. You know that James is the brother of Jesus. He is the younger brother of Jesus. Jesus was the oldest, right? Mary was a virgin when she had Jesus, but she didn't stay a virgin. Later, she would have many children. Okay? All right. So that's why we don't refer to her as Virgin Mary anymore, because she was on being married. She had many children. I don't know if you've ever tried it, but bringing up is hard to do. I mean, it is. It, it, it's a hard thing to do. Breaking up is a hard thing to do. But the reality is there are times when it's necessary to break up. And all of us, I promise I get to you, all of us will have occasion when we need to break up. And I'm submitting based on the scripture and my testimony in my life is that I've got a lot of breaking up I've had to do and I need to do in my personal life. James here offers up the world as a friend of me, right? Somebody that looks like and feels like a friend, but is really an enemy. And because the world is an enemy of God, that means that you can't have the pleasure of making the world your friend. Hmm. You can't have the pleasure, I'm saying for myself, I can't have the pleasure of being just like the world and then saying I'm passionately in love with Jesus Christ. Right? So on Sunday, you know, I'm a worshiper, but throughout the week I'm just in the world, I'm there, this is... You know, I'm living like it's golden, it's diamonds and pearls, I got everything I want, I'm a happy camper. Hmm. But we don't get that pleasure of living for this age. We live for another friend of me. Okay, let me see if I can, but I don't know if you saw Waiting to Exhale, it's an old movie, but you ought to see it if you haven't seen it, simply because of the classic scene, I'll tell you the classic <coughs> scene where uh, Angela Bassett, Bernadine Harris, she you see her, she puts her child on the bus, everything seems normal, until in a, the second, the, the camera crops on her eyes, right? And her eyes look fierce. I mean, it looks like she's getting ready to beat somebody up. And in fact, then, after the camera crops on her eyes, it shows this huge closet which the, with the finest man's clothing. I mean, at least 20 pairs of shoes, hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of dollars of, of just probably thousand dollars, I take that back, of clothing. And she begins to grab each piece, and I can't say word for word what she said because then you have to send me out because she was cussing. And she said, uh, there are murderers who are less anal than you. 732 times, she begins to grab every article of clothing, she balls it up, she takes it to the car, all the while cussing and fussing, she puts it in the sunroof of a Mercedes in the garage, she feels it, takes all the clothes out. Finally, she takes this Mercedes, filled with clothes, her husband's clothes. She backs it out to the driveway, she lights a cigarette, <coughs> after taking a couple pops, putting gasoline on the clothes, throws a cigarette, and she should have had an Oscar just for the walk away. She walked away from that car. The reason she did that is because after 11 years, she found out that her husband, who should have been her friend, was really a friend of me. Her husband left her for someone else after she had sacrificed, supported, loved, and blessed him and built his career. So now she's enraged because she's discovered that her lover is a friend of me. Okay, that might be offensive for some of you because that's not in the Bible. Let me give you the Bible. It's that in fact in Judges, his name is Samson. Now Samson had a lady's problem. He always picked, this is why you shouldn't pick your spouse, let God do it. He always picked the wrong ladies. He liked to look at them and if they looked good, he picked them. <laughs> I'm not trying to warn you, I'm just saying. He liked to look at them, and if they looked good, he picked them. He liked curves. And if they looked good, he picked them. That's true. So check it out. Check it out. Read the story. And oftentimes, when we find Samson, he is asleep 
with Delilah. I'm just in the Bible. And so consequently, each time he sleeps with Delilah, she wakes him with the question, please tell me, what's your secret? Where is your power? <laughs> and uh, finally, of course, you know, she cuts his seven locks, and then he has no more power. He is weak. He discovered that Delilah was a friend of me, someone who looks like and feels like a friend, but is really an enemy. Okay, I told you lovers. Now I'm going to tell you about brothers. It's Adolf and Rudolf Dazzler. Check them out sometime. Adolf and Rudolf Dazzler, they started a shoe company in the 1920s in Germany, and they did well. I mean, they were making money hand over foot in their shoe company. They were doing really well, but somehow the money caused them to really go at odds. In fact, they, they went to war with each other. They own the company. They're brothers, blood birth brothers, but they go to war with each other. In fact, it was also World War II. Uh, a bomb shelter was nearby. They were being bombed on, so the Adolf family, his wife and his children, ran into the bomb shelter. Later on, the Rudolph family had to get to a bomb shelter too, so they went and discovered it was the same bomb shelter. So the Adolf family says, the blank, the blanks have come here too. I didn't say what it was because I didn't want to cuss at you. But the point is, they thought they were talking about the brother, but they were talking about the bombers. And so then the family separated. Rudolph, who they called Rudy, started a company known as Adidas. And Adolf, I'm sorry, Adolf started Adidas, and Rudolph started Pumas. And up until the 1990s, the companies couldn't stand each other. They should have been friends, but they were enemies, frenemies. The reality is, I've come by to tell you the truth is, you've got someone in your life who you think is your friend, but they're really an enemy. And here I'm not talking about someone, I'm talking about a spirit. It's the spirit of the world. We like to think that we can engage in everything in this world and it not have effect on us. But the truth is, God says through James, the brother of Jesus Christ, he says, look, if you are friends with the world, you are an enemy of God. Okay, maybe that's, uh, let me see if I can make it practical so I can tell I haven't got you just yet. Imagine if tonight I didn't go to my house, but I went to my neighbor's house. Because my neighbor, she said she wanted to cook me a dinner. All right? Wouldn't something be wrong with that picture? Yeah, I'd be dead, my wife would shoot me. So the reality, is, the reality is, you understand in the natural how crazy it is to have friendships that are inappropriate, but in the spiritual, somehow we think we can have relationships that are inappropriate and it doesn't bother God. But the Bible says to be a friend of this age, to be a friend of this world, to be in this world and act like you are of this world, that is wrong. You are an enemy of God when we do that. So in fact, the Bible says, you adulterous generation. It's talking to me and it's talking to you. And it's challenging us to be faithful to God. So here's the test. How do you know if you are a frenemy of this world? Are you ready? First, you know you're a frenemy of this world. The text teaches us because you have cluttered convictions. It's verse 1. And I want you to see it because you're warned against your members. It wasn't talking about us just warring against each other, but it's talking about us having things on the inside that want to go right and want to go left. We don't know what we want. We have cluttered convictions. We're not sure. We're not sure who we are, what we want. We have cluttered convictions. You know, and I know, that I'm a friend of this world when my conviction is not clear, when I'm not absolutely sure of who I am and what I am. Okay, we're getting ready to celebrate. Uh, Harriet Tubman, she's going to be on the $20 bill. That's exciting, you know. She's going to be on the $20. I like the story of Harriet Tubman. In fact, I think it's significant that she's on the $20 bill because she used $20 to buy her parents out of slavery. Hmm. But everyone else she went back and rescued, but she bought her parents back with $20, right? Now, can I tell you that when she rescued people, she often either carried a rifle or a pistol, but she did not use these for slave masters. She used the rifle and the pistol for slaves who would get scared while they were running away. And they'd say, i got to go back, Harriet. I can't keep going with you. She'd take out a rifle and say, all right, you can go back, but I'm going to shoot you in the back of your head. You can either run with me, or you can die right here. Mm -hmm. She made sure that everybody was running with her had conviction. And this is the test to determine where we are in this age. Is our conviction clear? You can always determine your conviction by your commitments. So first, cluttered conviction, cluttered conviction, cluttered conviction. 
But then here's the next one. You can test to see if you're part of this world. You're stuck in this world. You know, you're living it like it's gold. Uh, you can tell because you'll have cruel intentions. It talked about quarreling, killing. Right? It talked about coveting. That's talking about how we as Christians, when we get in this world and we live like this world, we say it's a doggy dog world and I got to do what I got to do. If I got to steal somebody's girlfriend, I can do it. I, and whatever I have to do, I'll do it. Because it's a doggy dog world. When you, when you can do that, when you can live like that, when you don't have self-restraint, when you can't make yourself do what is right instead of doing what is wrong, that means you're living in this world. You're living for this world. You, 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 you've got a friend of me. You're cheating on God. You've got a chick on the other side. That, that's, what, that's what the text is saying. If, if you can deal with people with a lack of kindness, with a lack of grace, with a lack of love. In hmm. fact, you know when you speak against someone that's in a sense killing them, you're either killing their reputation or killing their spirit. So we're challenged with cruel intentions. So first it's a cluttered conviction, but then it's cruel intentions. But then here's the last sign that we are in an affair with this world. We have conceded petitions. He said, you pray amiss. You pray amiss. That your prayers aren't really prayers. They're these selfish petitions for your pleasure. And the Bible is clear about this. It talks about this over and over again. In fact, Jesus talks about it several times. Here's one, uh, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. There's a man who says this. He says, you know what? I've got so much stuff. And I've done so much. I've done it again. How'd you know? I mean, the Lord put it in my heart. Why'd you go? The Lord put it in my heart. That's what he wants from us. And you can give it to him right now. Complete conformity. Constant, uh, constant <coughs> consultation. Then finally, I take my seat. God wants complete credit. Hmm. God wants complete credit. You may not know this, but you are a shining star in this world. It could be your intellect. It could be your beauty. It might be your youth. It could be your style. It, whatever it is about you, people are looking at you and they're going, wow. It could be an older person. It could be a younger person. It could be a person with some struggle that you don't have. Hey, they're looking at you. They're looking at you. Hmm. And what they need to see is not someone who says, yeah, I've got it together, and I've always had it together. Hmm. They need to see someone who says, God did it. Come on. God did it. Hmm. How? God blessed me. He really opened up the door. When? God showed me. He really made it wet. How did you do? God bless me. When you live life giving God complete credit, people will give the God glory because of you. People will bless God because of you. When people look at you and say, hey, God has blessed you. You've been blessed by God. <laughs> That's what you want. You don't want anyone giving you credit for your life. I'm taking my seat with this story. Alex Haley, who wrote the story of Roots, I like Alex Haley, Dr. Haley. He had a picture in his office of a turtle, a little tiny turtle with the shell, you know, and the little legs. Turtles don't run fast, they don't kick, they don't fight. The turtle was on a fence post, high up on a fence post, protected, safe on a fence post. And somebody asked him, why do you have that picture of the turtle on the fence post? He says, I have that picture of the turtle on the fence post because that turtle reminds me of me. What do you mean? When you look at that turtle on the fence post, you recognize that somebody saw the turtle down, reached down, picked the turtle up, and put it in a safe high place. Well, your life and my life is just like that. God sees you and saw you, and he picks us up, and he puts us in high places. He puts us in safe places. It's not us. It's him. It's not you. It's him. It's God's grace and goodness in your life. Amen. Give him credit, and somebody else will. The truth is, God wants the glory, but he hmm. wants to give you the gift. Give him credit, and watch as he will. Come on, let's pray. God, if there's anyone in here who doesn't have an absolute certain relationship with you, if there's someone here who's been playing around with the world, they've been sleeping around with the world, they, they've made the world their home, God, would you speak to them right now? Touch them. Their heart, Lord, so they might give their heart to you and you alone, God. Would you let them know that you have something better than the world, something greater than the world, something bigger than the world. You've got something eternal, everlasting, and rich for them.